All right, I'm ready to go when you are, my friend. Let's do it. Ready for the first question? Absolutely. Outside of Cardano, you know, outside of all the deals, the partnerships, crypto, YouTube interviews like this one, the news, the noise, you know, the Charles that's just kind of hanging out on the farm, the ranch, what? is your favorite part of life? Like how is life number one, but what's your favorite part of life outside crypto? That's a great question. It's a good way to open it. Um, you know, uh, the problem with being an entrepreneur is that you start obsessed with something and it becomes kind of your life mission and, and you go and follow that. And then these concepts like work-life balance, health, you know, sanity, uh, they, they go out the window and you're just really pushing and pushing and pushing. And then what ends up happening if you start succeeding is that you start getting more blessings and fortunes. And then you get into a position where you can go up for air and you find that you're a bit asymmetrical as a person. Uh, so certain parts of yourself get hyper-developed, like your ability to solve complex problems and public speaking and your ability to perform well under stress. But then other things like your interpersonal relationships and potentially your capacity to express emotions and empathy, uh, other such things maybe got stunted because you underdeveloped them. You, you kind of put them on hold for five, 10 years while you're building your company. Uh, so uh, what I've been trying to do in the last few years has been take some time to really develop up that corpus. You know, so I've been meditating a lot more. I went to a silent meditation retreat for a whole week and you know, I, I bought the ranch and I raised bison and, you know, I, I've been trying really hard to connect to the earth. And so I grow a lot of stuff. I, you know, my, for everything from mycological endeavors where I grow lion's mane to hydroponic crops to hay in the fields, you know, these types of things. And it grounds you a lot. You know, the other thing is I've been trying very heavily to improve empathy and, and my ability to relate, communicate with people, because I think there's a huge deficit for that in the world. Uh, so I try to find ways, just put myself in other people's shoes and, you know, try to relate to them and in some cases work with them. Uh, and I also have a lot of old passions that I had to put on the, on the coat hanger. Like for example, video games, you know, when I was a kid, that was a big part of my life and most people can relate. And then, you know, become an entrepreneur, you know, first to academia, you know, you can't, you don't have time for it. You're busy studying and these things. And then you become an entrepreneur, you don't have time for it. You're busy building a company. So it's been good to kind of get back into that a little bit and say, okay, well, I can't be there like I used to, but maybe I can be there in a different way that's somehow synergistic to the entire lifestyle. So any given week, it's uh, it's always something different. And uh, I just got back from Las Vegas, for example, I was at the Consumer Electronics Expo and there was like a Cardano reason. There were some NFT players there, but also it was biomedical. You know, I was there with my dad and brother. They're both doctors. And we spent a lot of time just going through talking to people, do biosensors and all these other things and just seeing the state of the art there. And it was so cool to be talking with my dad and my brother, you know, and having a discussion, how could we apply this for health and wellness and improve people's lives? And, uh, and actually see the future. You know, we'd always been talking about these things like real-time continuous glucose monitors or other things. And now they're there, they exist. And you can say, okay, well, now that we have them, what do we do with them? And so those are the kinds of things I do for fun, you know, and they add a lot of value to my life and they, and they give me a lot of grounding and clarity and they help me kind of manage the negativity and toxicity and damage that uh, cryptocurrencies tend to inflict on people. It's a very unusual industry where you get brutalized. It's almost like being a politician and you have to go through this cleansing and detox and, you know, kind of, you know, reset your soul in a certain respect because every week is so brutal. It really, it really is. I can definitely relate to that. And you were just talking about that re that retreat, the meditation retreat you went on. And I, you know, I read your blog post on that and like the, the thing that stuck out to me the most was you wrote like this paragraph or two about um, a salt shaker. And like I had a similar experience. I was in a diner like a long time ago, but I totally related to what you were like, what you were writing about. And you were trying to kind of describe, I think, you know, you were you were analyzing the salt shaker, of course, but you were also talking about like the people that are actually behind that little salt shaker. Right. And if you look around and there's people there's human beings around like 
everything around us and like that humanity of it and I've been trying to grasp this is kind of like overlaps with what you were just talking about, like bringing that into the crypto space because the crypto space is really toxic. Like it's something I've grown to really realize. And I was having a conversation with somebody just, I think yesterday about it. And it's kind of like, sometimes I'm like, why, what am I doing here? Spending all day like on Twitter and YouTube and doing crypto stuff right. when it's, when it's all this negativity, like, what am I dealing with this? There's like a life, out there there's people to serve there's people to help but then i kind of backtrack and this is where long story short i want your thoughts here how do you bring what you were talking about that salt shaker the people behind that right how do you bring that into crypto like that the humanity of it the humanness that is out there how can we do that the bridge the gap yeah yeah it's what i've thought about a lot too you, you, you know a lot of people say well, why are you talking about toxicity suck it up buttercup well, if you're that materialistic and that much of an asshole, I'll sell it to you this way. It hurts your investment. Uh, it, toxicity prevents more people from coming in, it prevents the growth of the ecosystem. Who the hell wants to go to a bar when they walk in the front door, there's a bar fight. You're like, nah, I'm going to turn around and go somewhere else because I don't, I don't want none of this. You know, if you have immensely negative, toxic people everywhere and everything is so politicized and factioned and the minute you step in, like, for example, Fortune 500 adoption, we live in a situation in this industry right now that if a company like Microsoft or Apple decides to do a blockchain project, they will get from day one brutalized for not picking blockchain X or Y and for picking blockchain Z. Normally, when you do a product announcement, you you know you, you're excited. It's it's wow, they're doing this innovative thing, Microsoft Hololens. And they say, how dare you run that on Ethereum? How dare you run that on Bitcoin or something like that? So as a Fortune 500 company, you start thinking, well, maybe I shouldn't do anything in this crypto space. So you've just now denied our industry as a whole tens of millions of new users who will float around and have preferences across the board. So even if Samsung or, Ethereum or uh, Microsoft or Google pick Blockchain X, by bringing their user base there, they've just brought in 10 million new crypto users or something like that, or a billion. And that's good for us all. But you can't get past that with the maximalism and the toxicity. They can't see beyond that. So you ask, well, how do you bring it in? This weekend, I did something new. I, it was one o'clock in the morning. I was just about to go to bed. And I figured, hey, it'd be fun to do one of these Twitter spaces for 10, 20 minutes. And so I just said, chat with Charles. And I created it. I had 1,600 people within five minutes inside the uh, Twitter space at one o'clock in the morning, Mountain Standard Time. I, and I ended up speaking for three hours and it was great, really positive experience. A lot, of, a lot of love there, a lot of good people there. So I think part of the experience is understanding that the vast majority of people in the cryptocurrency ecosystem are not toxic and are not bad people and uh, they're just silent. And so they get drowned out by these very radicalized subset of people who, frankly, they're not happy about anything, no matter what you accomplish or what you do. And so you, you don't pay attention to one group and pay attention to the other. That's one side of it. The other thing is you always have to understand the root cause of why people have issues. What's their hidden pain or their issue? A lot of these criticisms are projections. They don't have confidence in themselves or projects or they're concerned about something, so they try to project it onto others in some way to alleviate the issue. There is some legitimate criticism. I mean, if you're too slow or something like that, I and mean, that's an issue more of values. So, you know, a lot of people feel, for example, Cardano's too slow to market. Okay. Uh, but we could be real quick to market and half our software can't work. Would that be okay? Uh, would it be okay if every week we had a billion dollars stolen? Or, you know, something like that, like what we're seeing in the industry as a whole, would that, would that be an acceptable outcome? But we ship software five times faster, you know? And then you have to ask yourself, well, what are the values behind that? When people say you're too slow, well, it's because they want money. They figured if you get a larger network effect, the token price goes up and then they can sell, get a Lamborghini. So are they really doing anyone, any service or any good if the vision, mission and goals are about changing the world, not about making a speculator rich? So you have to categorize the toxicity and the criticism and understand the root cause of it. Is it a concern or an issue? Is it just personal greed? Is it a misunderstanding? Is it tribalism? Whatever it happens to be. And then you'll just communicate with people the self-defeating nature 
of what they're doing and how they're communicating and say, look, we can go down this road. You're not going to win, but let's say we go down this road. At the end of the day, um, all you're doing is hurting the ecosystem as a whole, you know, and just try to change perspective. Like if you know a really negative person, what you do is you say, you know, they come in, oh, my knee hurts, my back hurts. Oh, Biden did this. Ah, ah. We all know that Debbie Downer. Um, and so what you do is you take them and say, tell me one positive thing. And it yeah. knocks them out. And they're like, ah, now I have I to think it. of something positive, right? And sometimes it's super hard. They like they spend like five minutes just like thinking about it. And then eventually they say something and mumble it under their breath and say, there, that's a start. You know, so you see, and I, I have one person I know so negative. Every time I run into him, I say, I'm not going to talk to you unless you tell me something positive. So the first thing out of their mouth has to be said. It could be, it's a nice day today. There we go. And they always try to put a, you know, like a negative spin to it. It's a nice day today, but the weather is going to get bad. No, you can just stop it at nice day. That's it. <laughs> I love that. I love that approach. Tell me one good thing or I'm not right. going to talk to you. <laughs> right. That's awesome. All right. So. Well, I appreciate, I appreciate your thoughts on that. It's, uh, and th it's such a good point. And I like the, the twist of the spaces you did. I was, I think I was sleeping when you were doing that, but, uh, that was cool. I, I, I saw that you did that Cardano. Um, I want to read, I want to read this thing you wrote. It was in December, 2017. I want to get your thoughts on it. Sure. You, you were writing about the, the progress of Cardano, which was, you know, in December, 2017. And you said this, you said, I've never been here for the short term. It's always been the dream of finding a way to get financial services to the 3 billion people who don't have them using technology that was only a dream a generation ago. And I think we're making great progress here. So that was like shortly after the buyer and error, I guess, launched, right? Right. And you, were, you, you mentioned you're making great progress. Now here we are like a little over four years. Um, I want to ask you now, how is it progressing? Ah. Well, you know, let's look at what we accomplished. Um, we went from a, a static and federated system uh, that didn't have smart contracts, uh, that had a very small community, that would had a very little liquidity, uh, to uh, an ecosystem in the top ten with, you know, over a hundred exchanges, two million people, a hundred and now thirty DApps being built, two million assets issued on it. We've gone from the Byron era to the Shelley era to the Gogan era successfully. We've never had a major downtime in the network history. Uh, hundreds of billions of dollars of value have been moved in the year 2021. Uh, and we also have written 130 academic papers. We defined the entire science of proof of stake. Uh, and we learned an enormous amount along the way about new development models, like, for example, extended UTXO which is the only way, in my view, to bring smart contracts to Bitcoin. And it enables things like Mithril and uh, Hydra in short order. Uh, so I think a lot's been accomplished. And when people look back at all of that, they'd say, okay, you know, if somebody told you we'd achieve all of that in a four-year period, you know, would you take that deal? They'd say, of course. And they'd say, you're crazy to see that kind of growth and that kind of systematic effort and so forth. But what they do is they get so caught on the narrow and say, well, you know, smart contracts were supposed to be here or decentralization is supposed to be here. We had to rewrite the software three times. There were major changes in architecture and vendors. There were approaches that were taken that didn't work out. There were course delays. Well, you know, Vitalik said that in 2015, he said Ethereum uh, 2 was going to come out 2018. Worst case scenario, you know, and, you know, it's 2022. He's saying it may be 2025. Yeah, so does that mean everything Ethereum's ever done and achieved is uh, is bad? No, it's just it's just the nature of the game, and there's things you learn along the way. In some cases, you're overly optimistic. Um, there were product and project management methodologies we were following that we thought would properly estimate things. Turned out they were wrong. People behind that aren't here anymore. We have completely different ways of running product and project management. We're far more accurate. When we have delays, they're usually in the months or weeks, not in the years in these types of things, which means we're converging. Now, what's nice, though, is one thing that's never been wavering has been the product market fit, and we've made enormous project progress there. I'll get into that in a second. But then also the, the clarity that the science has brought us. We don't sit around wondering, gosh, how do we scale? You know, gosh, how do we make this secure? Gosh, how, do we know this is going to work? We know. We already know. 
We have enormous advantages in our network stack design, enormous advantages in our consensus protocol design. We know the limitations of the system and the robustness of it. So it's not a matter of if, but simply how long will it take to roll out. So when we look at things like pipelining, import endorsers, you have all these people running around, dag this, dag that, dag this, third generation this, super high TPS. Well, Input Adorsers effectively does that for you. And that was something we came up with in 2016. And we had a follow-up paper in 2018, Parallel Chains. Both went through peer review. So we know the science is settled. We have a really good understanding of it. We know how to build it. So, and we know that we're now in a position where it can be built because the foundations are mature enough to be able to roll these types of things out. So there are very few projects in this space that have so much clarity about how to put all the pieces together from how to get great user experience and like clients to how to do microtransactions to how to accelerate the base ledger. And a lot of people say, well, you're just taking Charles's word for it. It's like, well, no, we wrote 130 papers and there's an army of engineers and all these other things. We did all the work up front. And if we hadn't done that, then it would be just like Vitalik with his prognostications about, uh, you know, Ethereum 2 and Casper, where they keep doing it until they run into a roadblock, then they have to throw it all away and keep doing it until they run into a roadblock and throw it all away. We don't quite run into that. So I think this year is going to be our most productive year. And, you know, people on Twitter, they like putting up that quote where I made a prediction about the amount of dApps and assets. Well, I was wrong in both directions. I was under optimistic about assets there's two million assets that have been issued on <laughs> cardano i was overly optimistic on the amount of dApps but to be fair we have 130 under construction and we're in the infancy of plutus and we haven't even turned on all the ethereum interoperability so if you look at that projection and you project it out the year if that keeps going with catalyst support uh, we're probably going to be right in that projection all right it was raw off by about a year does that materially change the protocol does that materially change the science? Does that materially change the use of utility? And then on to Africa, you know, we did the Africa tour last year. We went South Africa and Burundi and Zanzibar and Ethiopia and Kenya and Egypt. And we put ourselves in a great position over the last four years to actually start realizing what I was talking about, the TED Talk in 2014. There has been an enduring consistency in our messaging, vision, and philosophy about this project. We've never wavered once. We said, three billion people, let's go find them, let's get them in. And we have a beautiful approach to do that. We've brought millions on board with PRISM, B2B to C acquisitions. We have great partners on the ground that we're actively working with in Africa, nation states we're working with. So there's an inevitability that we get a shot at the vision of changing the lives of billions of people as an ecosystem. And we know the technology is fit for purpose because we built it that way. Everything from the metadata standards to the prison-based identity standards to how we approach scale, how we approach participation. The other thing is the people in the ecosystem care about the mission. You know, you think about growth, you have to ask yourself, who are you inviting into your house? If you get people in, the only thing they care about is making money, speed, and cost. Then if you go to them and say, hey, let's hyper-centralize the system and give Amazon total control, and you'll save 25%, they'll be like, where do we sign up? We love money. So you have to be really careful with how you grow and how you indoctrinate the philosophy of the system, just like Bitcoin was. No one was money motivated in the early days of Bitcoin because there was no money to make. You know, Bitcoin was worthless. There were StarCraft tournaments where your fifth prize, your consolation prize was 25 Bitcoin. Your first prize was $100. I mean, if you're, ah, I got these worthless Bitcoin things. What the hell are those, right? But it grew into this Goliath because it was born of principles. And so when you look at your initial population, you have to say, where do they come from? What's your churn rate? What are your growth factors? And one of the things that people cannot deny is the strength of the Cardano community the passion of that community, the philosophy, the philosophical purity of that community, and the fact that most people here just want to do the right thing and they want to change the world. And they're comfortable with the idea that they're not a passive, but rather an active participant there. We have this saying in Cardano, grab a shovel, get it done, go out there, plant some trees. Uh, and we see the stake pool operators doing clean water projects. We see people doing healthcare projects, charity projects. Some are faith-based. Some are philosophies. Some are setting up NGOs. There's a SPO down in South America that's feeding children in Argentina. Everybody is finding something to do, some way to help, and use this system to do so. 
And as the tooling and capability of the system grows, that's only going to increase. And people are participating in droves with Catalyst. We have the largest decentralized organization in the world running the distribution of funds for, uh, for the treasury of Cardano. Every round, the participation metrics go up. The amount of funded ventures go up. We're over 300. And those will bear fruit in their own right and lay the lens for a thousand flowers. So I feel very strong. I feel we're in a very strong position. I think we've made enormous progress, especially when you zoom out a little bit and you look at where we were at and how weak we were to how strong we are now and how fast it's all coming together. And the fact that every aspect is covered by some paper or piece of technology that we know works. And it's just an ma inevitable matter of getting all those pieces together. And if winning means you have to compromise on quality and have $10.5 billion a hacks a year and not care about people and surrender to centralization or reset the network anytime it breaks manually, uh, I don't want to win. You know, I'd, I'd much rather lose with some integrity. And frankly, I think it's neither. I think we're going to win with integrity because that's ultimately what crypto is all about. That's the point of crypto is the principles of it. Or, or else you're just building another legacy system and trading you know, Goldman Sachs for Ethereum or Goldman Sachs for Newcoin or something like that. What the hell's the point? It makes no sense. I think it's a good testimony of of the blockchain itself to see, as you were mentioning, all the different mission related things that are growing out of out of this technology. And and that's one of the things that really uh, intrigues me about it, what it can be used for. I think about World Mobile a lot when we start talking about that. Um, so World Mobile, Zanzibar, you touched on Ethiopia. The path to a billion users, a billion plus users, three billion users. Is that like that type of thing what's going to get get Cardano there? Or, or are there many different arms in that story? Yeah, there's tons of arms. And it's not a unilateral path where you know I'm going to figure it all out. I have a particular itch to scratch, which is the developing world. And that's what I'm going to go do, along with some other things. And every now and then we stumble upon a Fortune 500 like Dish that wants to come in and work with us. And we say, great. It's very exciting. Uh, but then there are other people like the foundation, they're, they're going to try to onboard 50 banks, you know, and there are other people who are onboarding their local community and doing community-based projects or building companies like Sunday Swap, for example, on the ecosystem. And then if the technology is great, it's better, faster, and cheaper than most of the people in the space, if not all of them. So people are just cost conscious will come in. Uh, and there are other people where they have assurance requirements that only Cardano can satisfy. So they'll come in. So it takes a village, and this is not one company sitting down figuring this out. Your path to a billion is a, a multi-model and a multi-agency model, just like Bitcoin, where everybody feels some form of accountability. In the early days of Bitcoin, BitPay sponsored the St. Petersburg Bull, it became the Bitcoin Bull. You know, in the early days of Bitcoin, uh, Roger Ruhr was going around convincing barbers and coffee shops to accept Bitcoin. And he wouldn't leave until they took the, the Bitcoin. I mean, there was, there was all, so many different people from all wakes of ways. Andreas Antonopoulos going on Joe Rogan's podcast, doing Mastering Bitcoin. You know, Eric Voorhees doing Shapeshift, these types of things. So everybody has a place and a role. And great ecosystems give people the freedom and luxury to have a place and a role and to feel comfortable like they're welcomed and included. And bad ecosystems, they start taking that away from you and telling you what you have to do and you feel like only one person can solve all the problems. That's that's uh, that's not right. So we have some strategies, I think, that can get a lot of great user acquisitions. Beautiful light client experience, you know, getting it in the browser and making sure that you have a beautiful DAP store combined with a great voting center and, you know, really nice identity. Furthermore, Catalyst is going to be extended to give you voting and governance tools for the DAPs and native assets that are issued on Cardano as much as Cardano enjoys. So in DeFi, there's a huge surge, especially when regulation comes for it, to decentralize. And you need governance for that. So that means all these DeFi protocols have to basically figure out how to write voting protocols and become governance experts and all these other things. Well, what if you get that for free, incumbent in the platform itself? That's a huge competitive advantage when people are migrating. Because at the end of the day, they're not loyal to the underlying infrastructure. They don't wake up and say, boy, how do I make Joe Lubin and Vitalik rich today? Nobody says that. You know, they're just using it because it has network effect and it's a means to an end, but it comes with a lot of trade-offs and at some point you have to migrate. And so either they go layer one and build their own chain or 
they go to a different chain. And so, you know, the question is, are the USPs appealing enough? And over time, they've become that way. And it's a marathon, not a sprint. Just because you have great network effect today, I, one of my favorite ways of explaining the value of network effect and technology is saying, if you really believe that's a big deal, I tell you what, pull out your BlackBerry phone, okay, go to Yahoo and search for your MySpace page, uh, go ahead and find it and log in with your AOL account uh, and then post on MySpace uh, your feelings about all of it uh, on your Windows computer. <laughs> you know, Man, I mean, that's getting that's, me all nostalgic over here. Yeah, I know. That's network <laughs> effect, right? And yeah. at one point, all of those were the market leader. Okay, they had all the power and now they're all gone. So network effect is ephemeral in technology and it's connected directly to evolution of technology, consumer preferences, and the evolution of business models. And the fact that people age out. The next generation comes in with no preference. All these people in Africa have zero preference to these types of things. Uh, Cardano, in some cases, are first cryptocurrency. So that's only valuable for a moment, and it gives you the ability to stay alive for that moment. It gives you the luxury of being able to make bets. But if you're too slow, you could lose out the whole thing. There's a famous memo that Microsoft Research wrote in the 90s that basically Bill Gates commissioned. He said, tell me about the next 10 years. And in the memo, they predicted the rise of Google, Facebook, and the iPhone. So Microsoft had the means, the position, and the knowledge of where the future was, yet they missed all three. Yeah. So they were the Goliath, $600 billion company, the largest tech company in the world at the time, and they had a monopoly, yet they, they weren't able to navigate. So network effect is only so good and only so powerful. And, you know, oh, Google's so powerful. What if they win, they lose the metaverse and everybody's on the spatial web? They're going to be contextually searching in a geolocational space. So they don't have to use the Google search engine to search. So it might be the case that 100% of desktop searches, cell phone searches, and other things are still done with Google. But what ends up happening is that people grow around them. That's what happened to Microsoft. They never lost the desktop war. They had near 95% installation on desktops and laptops with Apple having the rest. But then everybody just started getting iPhones and, and Android phones and tablets and things. And it turned out the preferred computing device wasn't a laptop. And uh, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't a desktop. It was a cell phone and a tablet. And so now there are four times as many of those devices as there are Windows computers. So they never lost a customer, but they lost the war in that respect. So it's all about that type of growth curve. And you have to think about the next five years and 10 years, where will people be using these things? For example, if you're an NFT guy, you have to be a credible metaverse player. Because that's what's going to preserve NFTs. It's analogous to domain names in the web browser. You know, so the web is infinite, but you need some scarcity there. So how about Microsoft.com, Google.com, these types of things. That's real estate in the web. And if you own it, it could be worth millions of dollars. Well, similarly, NFTs connected to a metaverse, that creates scarcity in an unlimited spatial world. And then suddenly you will have the equivalent of a Microsoft.com or that type of real estate in the metaverse. So if you're serious about NFTs, that's an area where you have to dominate it and do something good in. Has anybody yeah. succeeded in that yet? No. And new players are entering all the time and there's no network effect there. And there's fundamentally different technology to be a good player there. And there's a great book called The Spatial Web that talks about that. Another is called The Infinite Retina that talks about it. That's just one example. If you talk about regulation, you need to win the identity war and the metadata war because you, compliance is coming. How many people have a path to, to contingent staking to comply with the 2023 mandate the infrastructure bill? We do. Our competitors don't. These things. So you have to think where the puck is going, where the future is going, if you want to exist in that world. And network effects rapidly and radically change based upon this emerging and changing landscape. A VR, AR is going to be fucking huge. Apple's entering this market. They have 5,000 engineers working on a headset called the QO. KUO, 5,000, probably 2023, 2024 is coming out. The minute that happens, Samsung's there, Microsoft's there. Everybody's going to be in that market. It's going to be in eyeglasses within the next seven years. So the AR revolution is coming there. Everything's going to change with that. So where does your blockchain fit in this type of a thing? You see, who are the biggest adopters that will give you billions of customers? You ask, well, how do I get a billion? What if I got Microsoft on board? One client, three and a half billion customers. You know, what if it got built into Windows? You'd, you'd have it just right there. How do you get there? Well, what do they care about? Do they care about growth? No, they already own the whole market. They care about safety, compliance. They care about 
software quality, these types of things. We win there. Our competitors don't because they focused on a JavaScript as dot com move fast and break things model. And when regulation comes, who gets hit the hardest? The people who have no strategy and plan to accommodate for it. The ones who do, they win. So the game is not even close to over. And, you know, there's, there's, there's tons of things to do. And it's, it's just all about what vision and philosophy you have five years, 10 years, 15 years out. Do you have a community that help you get there? And do you have the patience and appreciation to know when to strike and when to hold back and how to build as much as you have to when to grow and acquire? Like I get often asked, me, Joe Rogan effect, when are you going to get on it? Well, guys, if I got a Joe Rogan and we weren't ready for it, we'd have 11 million people say, oh, he's a real cool dude, or say he's a douchebag. But in any event, where do they go next? There's no funnel to capture them. So you just missed your greatest marketing opportunity in the history of the project. If you have a funnel, you can capture some of them, even 1%, 100,000 new users, right? So timing is very important in these things too, of how quickly do you roll things out? Cardano comes with a lot of responsibility. When you hold ADA, you're not passive. You're staking, you're delegating, you're voting, you're participating, you're building. There's a lot there. And so there are educational demands on the community. The voting demands, the democratic demands on that community to be a citizen in this Cardano nation are huge. Now, over time, those barriers to entry go down and the tools get better and so forth, but it takes time to get there. So if we suddenly got 10 million users, boy, that'd be a headache. But what we're basically being told is you have to get them now or else you'll never get them. And I say, okay, well, I look at these roadmap competitors, uh, you know, the roadmaps of the competitors, I see nothing there that's capturing the future. I see the same predictable buzzwords again and again. TPS, infinitely scalable, rah, 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 rah. They just say stuff. And then I see the protocol design, and I know they're going to have to rewrite the protocols like Ethereum has to, which means that the minute they admit that, they're going to go down the same road Ethereum's gone down, only they have less money and less time to do it, and not the same network effect to do it. And also, they don't have any of the engineers or scientists necessary to actually conceive of these protocols. So they're going to have to copy some of our stuff and people like Algorand stuff and so forth that actually thought about the future and have the engineers and the, the scientists. So how am I in a bad position if, if that's the case? You know, you can disagree with it, okay. But then you have to honestly tell me, it's like, well, what is their strategy then? How are they going to get there? And so forth. And they usually don't. They just talk about token price or performance or, you know, some vanity partnership with some, or they put their logo on a Formula One car or they put their logo on a stadium or something, you know, or, you know, subway car. Oh, look how smart we are. We, we paid a bunch of money to get some people to look at this or we're running commercials with Matt Damon. You know, we're, we're getting it done. You know, <laughs> I've never run a commercial with Matt Damon. No commercials yet. Right. No. <laughs> what the funnel you just talked about, right. You know, in real, in relation to going on Joe Rogan and, and getting that influx of people, what does that funnel look like? You know, what, what do you envision that funnel looking like to be ready? Okay, so there's what's good for me and my company, and then there's also what's good for Cardano. Because if I go on Rogan, I'm not just going to talk about Cardano. I'm probably spend more time talking about other stuff than Cardano. Because you know it's an interesting conversation. Talk about hunting and bison and mushrooms and all kinds of. It'll be fun. We'll, we'll break the all time record. You know. Uh, so what you need is you need a clear call to action that if people are legitimately interested in the vision and philosophy of Cardano. First, you need to demonstrate you've actually done something. It's not just aspirational. So we have done a lot, but I'd like to be a little further along. For example, I'd like to have a fully functional stablecoin and peer-to-peer -peer lending marketplace ready to go. So people, when they go, they can pull out their phone, download a beautiful mobile wallet, you know, and then they can actually see right there a way to lend money to someone in Kenya or something like that. I'd like them to be able to create real-time an identity and use that in their workflow, this type of stuff. Now, there already are some ways to do this, and they're being used at scale of millions, but they're not user-friendly enough that an average Joe Rogan listener would want to do that. So that's an example of a benchmark. Then, you know, the right websites, the right user experience with those. So when they go to cardano.org, they know exactly where to go, and they know exactly what route to take and where they can participate from, you know, volunteer, what have you better voting experience, and these types of things. So a lot of user experience needs to be improved and a lot of accessibility needs to be improved. And also the information needs a little bit more time to get refined and polished and made accessible and so forth. 
Uh, so those are examples of things that would go into that strategy. And then also it has to be relatable because no one goes to a cryptocurrency if they're serious in a non-speculative way, unless there's something connected to a problem they want to solve. For example, let's say you're a doctor uh, or a pharmaceutical researcher, and you're looking at electronic medical record system. You say, boy, I would love to have a system where I can find out how many asthma patients have COVID and what that compares to the regular population in terms of mortality. And I don't want it to do that, find that information by having to negotiate with a bunch of EMRs and have a data room and somebody actually see the de-anonymized data. Uh, I, I would like to just operate on encrypted data. Probably that in some way will be facilitated by a blockchain-based solution at some point. So that's an example of a real-life problem that has enormous commercial value, enormous research value, can't be solved at the moment. Yeah. You know, uh, or you as a consumer, Let's say you know you go on vacation and, and you have a lovely time in the Maasai Mara in Kenya. You're on safari. Elephant charges the, the van, knocks it over. You get crushed. Your legs are broken. You're unconscious. They take you to the closest hospital they can find. Pretty grim story. And you're there, you're, and, and they're trying to figure out your medical history. They don't even know your blood type. And, and how do they get your medical records? How did that get transmitted from wherever there is in the United States to there in Kenya so they can actually know a little bit about you and hopefully treat you a little bit better? Well, they can't. There's no way to solve that problem right now in modern society, but you can solve that with a blockchain. So stuff like that, that's how you get people interested. You know, R Rogan, maybe he's not going to get any of this blockchain stuff, but he's a hunter. Every hunter has problems with hunting tags. Every hunter has problems with that whole area. That whole system can be put on a blockchain. Made a hell of a lot more fair. You, you go through that whole example of why it's better. And then what you do, he gets it. He says, oh, wow, that is really cool. Half of America thinks the elections are corrupted because of Trump. Whether you agree with that or not, no matter. The perception of a lack of legitimacy destroys democracy. The solution is not to say those people are bad people and stupid, suck it up, buttercup, uh, any more so than when the other side was saying that Russia stole the election for Trump and to tell them to suck it up. This, you restore legitimacy by adopting new systems that have inclusive accountability. So why don't you talk about how a voting system would work where you can check your own vote, make sure it's been counted, and it's transnational, meaning that a government can't tamper with it or, or a private company can't tamper with it or something like that. You don't have to trust somebody. You can check yourself and you have assurance for that. turns out the same problem to make sure you have money on a blockchain is to make sure there's a vote there because votes can be tokens, right? You know, so uh, so that kind of way, I think, is what you need. And you need really well-developed, crystallized talking points, use cases, and experiences to drag people there. And we're, we're and that's why I kept saying Rogan after Gogan, because that's where those really well-developed things start crystallizing. And what I can do is act as an advertiser-in-chief for the ecosystem. <laughs> It'd be real boring if I talked about myself. How about I talk about, hey, there's this great project that's doing this, and there's this great project doing this. And then suddenly these small projects get, you know, an 11 million person audience now looking at them, going to their website. will crash all their websites. If I crash their websites, I'm the happiest guy in the world. <laughs> and so I, I want to get to that point. So it's not just about our progress and where we think the funnel needs to be. We need to give the ecosystem a little bit of time to mature to a point where they can really showcase the value that they've created and then go do that. And it'll be a great conversation and hopefully get invited back like with Friedman uh, and these things. And also it provides a lot of real enduring tangible value to the ecosystem. And then people don't look at Cardano as yet another cryptocurrency or speculative instrument. They look at Cardano as a framework for dreams to be built, as a framework to do things a little differently and to restore trust and credibility in institutions and systems that lack them. Uh, and uh, make the world a better place. And that's kind of a that's kind of a perfect segue to one of the things I wanted to ask you because I'm just really uh, curious of your thoughts in something like this, which is, you know, around a month ago or so, Don Huffines, who's running for Texas governor, he tweeted. I think you saw the tweet, and he tweeted about Bitcoin. And I just I retweeted it, and I I, I said something along the lines of. I would love to have him on the show with you to talk about how Cardano could provide infrastructure for different applications, financial and social, social applications to be built. And I tweeted, I retweeted that because that, that 
that's where my head goes a lot is, is with things like that, right? So what kind of things could Cardano do for a state like Texas and other states? Like what, what does that world look like? What does oh, that conversation look a, like? Every domain and aspect that's frustrating, nepotistic, corrupt, inefficient can be innovated. And GovTech is one of our areas of expertise. You know, all that work we do in Africa, it's so amazing that Silicon Valley and all these other guys discount it. We're saying, well, we're beta testing like GovTech in the harshest possible environment. If it works there and at its scale, I can undercut all of you guys when we sell it to America. You know that. And it's better. <laughs> so, you know, don't, don't really throw that baby out with the bathwater. There's some real market value here. So let's look at Texas. Okay. Oil, uh, so, so mineral rights, water rights. I'm a rancher. Mineral water rights, big deal in the frontier, Texas included. And it gets pretty bad. All of that can be put on a blockchain. Massive efficiency gains. Whole voting system in the state can put on a blockchain. Absolute fidelity and credibility. No hacking. No participation by undocumented immigrants, uh, no, no participation by dead people, criminals, these types of things. You can every year know everybody eligible to vote of that set who voted, count the votes and know that uh, you have no waste, fraud and abuse. Radical transparency of the budget. Every single dollar spent by the state of Texas, you can track and trace. You can see where it went, the metadata behind it, and the audit trail on that. No more lost money. No more Pentagon waking up saying we lost a trillion dollars. We don't know where it went. None of that stuff happens. No more monkey business with any of those things. Okay, so you have radical transparency. Consent. Uh, for example, signing of contracts, you know, digital contracts, these types of things. You want to register a business. How about we make it a blockchain-based registration? And you can uh, file all your stuff there. You never have to interface with a government agency. Just a smart contract. Go ahead and pay. Texas can even try to issue its own currency, monetary policy. If they want to go big, go home. Lone Star State can, uh, can divorce itself a bit from U.S. monetary policy if they want to. Uh, they can issue stable coin, these types of incentives-backed tokens for carbon reduction, anything they want to do there. Okay, uh, They can route all of the charity programs and grant programs that they have and require blockchain-based auditing. So anybody who receives the money has to dial into a system and support a certain standard. So that same radical transparency can be pushed into the private industry as well. Okay, these are just some licenses and certifications, medical licenses, law licenses, anything licensed in the state. All those credentials can be put on a blockchain, made more uniform, easier to verify. It means as an employer, you never have to call a federal agency or a state agency to verify something. You can just check it in the database and you know if it's there, it's real. Identity theft. You can create a state ID with DIDs. You have a significantly stronger and more hardened system to ameliorate when people's identities have been stolen and resolve that. Privacy of data, data privacy, these types of things. Who owns your data? You can mandate that you do have self-sovereign identity. And all the surveillance, capitalism, Facebook, everything, say if you want to have a Texas customer, you have to follow this policy for the state of Texas. You know, these types of things. Uh, track and trace of the supply chains inside the state for health and safety. Uh, you say any food that you eat, that food has to follow a blockchain track and trace. And we need to have barcodes, QR codes. You scan it with your cell phone, you can see the origin. So if somebody in the state of Texas eating something, they know what they're putting in their body, 100%. Same for the vaccines. You can do all those things and more at a significantly lower cost than you could with the legacy system, and every single citizen of the state of Texas does not have to trust the state of Texas once that system's in place. They can verify it themselves, inclusive accountability. So you get free and fair elections, you get safe food, you get strong and free, stable money, you get much better property registration and, uh, and uh, zoning and all these other things, and you get a freer, more open society. Furthermore, it's all programmable. Meaning, if an entrepreneur wants to work with the state of Texas, build on the state of Texas's infrastructure, they don't have to go to the state and make a deal with them. Just like Apple with the App Store or Android with the App Store. Just build an app. There's an interface. There's an API. And you can deploy in a permissionless way. Better than Apple. Better than Android. And then suddenly you're serving the people of Texas and you have access to all those municipal services, you know, and you can get your fire service on board, you can get your police services, your emergency services on board, all these types of things. For example, let's say you care a lot about oversight of the police. It's a big pet project of yours. Well, maybe you make it so that all that body cam footage, it's hashed. 
and those hashes are put on the blockchain, which means you know if it's been tampered with and sections have been deleted, these types of things. Yeah. State of Texas can't change it once it's said. Little stuff like that. Civil asset <laughs> forfeiture. Create a whole blockchain system just for that and have oversight with it. And if the government gets it wrong, they lose the money and uh, maybe it takes a fine. You can, you can even create bonds and bounties. So when the government makes mistakes, uh, it, they actually get fined automatically by the system. It doesn't even go to the courts. So from an oversight viewpoint, you can do all kinds of crazy shit inside the oversight uh, to ensure that the government behaves correctly. And these are the kinds of conversations you can have with the constituencies and say, what do you value? What do you care about? And whatever you value, we can build it. And once we build it, it's going to work the way it was intended. Instead of don't be evil, it can't be evil, it won't fail. It's a lot more honest than any politician. Yeah. Man, just some things off the top of your head, just right there. <laughs> yeah. Thank we you do a lot that. of GovTech. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I see that. Thank you for the visualization of those solutions. Because I've just been kind of thinking about it ever since that tweet. He, we were in touch with him, and he's talking to his team about that, by the way. So that would be, I think it would be epic if, if we could yeah. somehow set up that conversation. Because I love that real world stuff. And, and I, I see Cardano, you know, from era to era, just, you know, completing these upgrades. I see it kind of just getting ready to do things like this, right? To provide solutions to, to right. places like Ethiopia and Texas. It's already starting to. Yeah, especially the state of Wyoming. I mean, just look at how much progress has been made there, and we're just getting started. So it'll it'll come, you know, and uh, it's, it's all about restoring faith and trust into institutions. Democracies and representative republics, they only work when you trust the institutions. If you don't trust them, you have to restore it. And you can do it through investigations and leadership changes and new laws and constitutional amendments. But when that process fails for too long, Eventually, the only recourse is a civil war uh, and, uh, and some new government coming in. And I don't want to go down that road. And so the alternative here is, frankly, just putting a new governance system in place through something that's not quite private and it's not quite public. And, and there's been attempts to do this. Uh, for example, with the Federal Reserve System, it's not quite private. It's not quite public. It's some sort of thing that lives kind of in between the two. You know, it's just it's just there. And the hope was that by doing it that way, it would somehow inoculate it from the politics of society. It failed miserably, but they at least tried. And the thing about blockchain is that it actually has the power to fulfill that dream. And the killer application, kind of like email was to the Internet, is monetary policy to blockchain. But by no means is it the only application, just like email is not the only application to the Internet. It just gets the party started. And once you start thinking that way, you go through line item by line item. Which institutions in society have lost trust and legitimacy? And then it's just a question of what do we need to build to restore it and bring everybody along so that we both agree, even if we disagree politically, that the institutions are solid. And if we can't, democracy fails. It can't work. If half of America feels the voting system is broken, they no longer will honor the legitimacy of that system. And they'll get angrier and angrier, and they'll feel because they can't express themselves through votes, they can only express themselves through violence. That's what always happens when you have a, a delegitimization of the system. So going into 2022, you've been talking a lot about this. Scalability and governance is kind of a focus there, right? What, what needs to happen to succeed there in order for Cardano to succeed with those two things? Big time in 2022. Well, well, on the scalability side, there are six things uh, that we're working on. And, you know, they're, they're just work. And we're making great progress on them. So, you know, and people can see that publicly. So, one, there's a large-scale optimization program. Like, for example, we just released Node 1.3.3, and it cut the sync time in half. And it's coming to Daedalus here in a little bit, but it's already deployed with the SPOs and the exchanges. Uh, so that's an example of just optimization, where now that we're moving from just a correctness focus to a performance focus, you're going to see lots of optimizations of libraries and business processes and things that traditionally take a while. And then that can be reflected by larger block size and all kinds of things. Okay, so that's one part of the agenda. Second part is pipelining. And the basic idea there is that normally in a blockchain system, you have a lot of work, no work, a lot of work, no work, a lot of work, no work, and that's the block production. So while the time between the block is being produced, the network's not really doing a lot. It's at a stall state. 
With pipelining, you amortize that cost over that no work period. So you get more work done. Okay. The follow up is introducing a DAG like idea. So input endorsers. So it's not quite a DAG, but it conceptually, you can think of it this way where between the blocks, you can do a lot of micro blocks. And those micro blocks basically aggregate up and serialize and they allow you to basically process as many transactions as the network will allow. So you're no longer constrained by block size, you're constrained by bandwidth and network availability. So as you optimize the network, you get even more throughput. And that's those things alone tend to push you into the 500 to 1,000 TPS range. And that's not really even fair because what is a TPS? You could have 1,000 inputs, 1,000 outputs potentially. And that from an Ethereum point would be 1,000 transactions. It's one transaction on Cardano, you see? So there's a lot of that. Then there's a kind of a meta thing that sits on top of that of smart contract optimization, just better utilization of the extended UTXO model and doing a lot more things off-chain. Then you have Mithril and Hydra, and that's the kind of number four and number five parts. And, and Mithril is about great light client experience. So basically, you can do parallel validation of the epics, so you get really fast sync for full nodes. So Daedalus gets a lot faster. And uh, the other side is that your light client has full node security. So whether you're using a browser-based client or a cell phone, you get the same security level as if you're using Daedalus, which means the preferred mode will be light clients for most people. Uh, and that's just great. Then Hydra is all about high TPS off-chain. So that's microtransactions to start. And then after that, state. So it's smart contracts off-chain. So just in time, as you move beyond that window of 500 to 1,000, you have Hydra as a place to do all those things on. And then finally, sidechains. And that's where you basically have different computing models. And you can layer those in and make them interoperable with the main chain model. And Mamba, Milk Media, these types of things are... Examples of that, they're already making great progress there. So those six things have to happen. And what's nice is they're well quantified. Like we have great plans for pipelining. We know how to do it. And it looks like it's for the Vossel hard fork. There's a high degree of certainty there. That's the, there are three hard fork combinator events this year, one in February, one in June, one in October. And we're getting to a point where, you know, we, we believe the dates, they, they, they make sense. And the packages of work are well-defined. And there's not a lot of specters lurking around to kind of, sting us in that respect and um it, go, ahead. go ahead i was gonna say and these are the things that are going to improve the the scalability aspect of yeah because higher tps means more stuff can happen uh, also faster syncing uh more like client user experience which means you can do things from a user experience instantly that used to take minutes or hours so every dimension of the experience will improve and thus the use utility of the system will improve. And there's kind of a side agenda to improve the express expressiveness of Plutus, which means it's more useful for a larger collection of dApps to build in the system. That's what SIP 31, SIP 32, and SIP 33 are about. And those will get done in June. Okay. Then on the governance side, that's all about getting a voting center and getting to a 50% voting participation rate. Okay, right now we're at about 70,000 people. Uh, we need about a million people. And the voting center will get us there give or take, and it's a process. Uh, so, and our indication of that is the staking participation. With staking uh, you know, center in Daedalus, we have 72% of the network staking. So if you have this equivalent area for people to easily vote and participate in the democratic process, it's not unreasonable to assume an equivalent number there. But that's a big part of governance because you want a majority of your people participating on a regular basis, and you need them to meaningfully participate. So we're creating things like an open governance API, so third-party governance stacks can be built and integrated in, you know, better data and tracking metrics, um, all kinds of surrounding infrastructures being built down to audit and provide oversight. An expert class is developing, delegative democracies developing, where you can delegate your vote to other people, these types of things. That will enable a governance system that can run the hard fork combinator, can run the system parameters, and so forth. <coughs> so you don't like K, change it. You don't like A not, change it, these types of things. You know, we can only bootstrap it, but ultimately the community has to make these decisions. And a corollary to that is the CIP process, as well as the open source project side of it. So there's a humongous effort underway right now. Very expensive, a lot of people working on it, to transition the custodial entities to a full open source project, kind of like what the Linux Foundation does with the Linux kernel, where 100 companies and 800 developers work full-time at managing and building up the Linux kernel. It's one of the largest, most successful open source projects in the world and most useful. It's not rocket science, just work. So build the institutions, you know, give them 
uh, a lot of running room. Like, for example, I met with the Cardano DeFi Alliance. Get them involved, these types of things. And then you have hundreds of entities come together and they can build everything up the whole stack from the, from the science to the formalization to the protocol design to the reference clients, to the interfaces, to the commercialization, to the marketing, to the verticals, all those things. Every part of the stack is basically getting that. And that, that's a huge part of the work package this year. And we're working on it. Foundation's working on it. VC Spark's working on it. Emergo's working on it. Uh, dozens of DAP development companies are working on it in their own way. And it's part of Catalyst as well. Uh, so uh, that's what has to happen for the government side. It's uh, it, it's less about research and it's more about social conventions and structures and getting people used to ideas and compelling behaviors and these types of things to participate. And every indication we have is we're moving in the right direction. If you look at the seven funding rounds of Catalyst, participation's been walking up very rapidly. And we have a phenomenal group of people, over 70,000, that regularly participate from the community. So it makes it the largest decentralized organization in the world. And, you know, just harnessing that and building down with that, it means it'll keep growing and it'll become, you know, so amazing. So uh, those are the two sides if for scalability and for governance. There's a lot more like interoperability and, uh, you know, some economics things that need to happen. And, you know, the side chains, there's lots to do there and so forth. It's, it's a lot. You know, there's hundreds of people, at least in my organization, who wake up every day and their full-time job is nothing but this. And there's 15 development companies outside of my organization that a large chunk of their revenue is working on Cardano and building Cardano that are completely independent of IO. So it's a humongous open source project, which is usually ignored by the industry. We're number one for GitHub commits. And their only answer is, well, you can game GitHub commits. Oh yeah, go fuck yourself. <laughs> you know, like, I just don't get it. I don't yeah. get I don't get the scrutiny. I don't get why it's so ignored. Especially when other guys like their networks just completely collapse. They have to kick it to turn it back on. And, and you know, us, it's just like, well, you know. You release smart contracts, but you know this thing wasn't ready, so fell. Why? Why is why is Card? Why does Cardano I, I, get that? Well, because we don't have no VC backing. You know, all these other guys are VC coins. You know, a large part of the distribution went to a small group of holders who also transitively own the media in crypto media. So you always look at who makes money and who doesn't make money. There was a very fair distribution in Japan with Cardano, and it it didn't launch like any of these other things. It had a very pure launch. So nobody really got rich in Silicon Valley. There was very little, actually no American participation, uh, no European participation. So all the European VCs, all the American VCs, you know, they, they missed it. And then a lot of these guys were listening to the Ethereum, Ethereum maxis. And so the Ethereum people were saying, Cardano is not just a bad project, it's a criminal project. It's a scam, it's a Ponzi scheme. So they just said, whoa, I, I can't touch that, no. No, Charles Hoskins is a pathologically lying sociopath and he's Bernie Madoff. You know, no, 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 I'm not, I don't want anything to do with that. So they missed the boat. And since they missed the boat, there's a confirmation bias where they focus on mostly what they can with negative. Uh, and, and, you know, who gives a fuck? It's a, I'm not here to take care of, you know, a small group of people in Silicon Valley or, you know, some people think they're big in the space. Space is a lot bigger than those people. Uh, you know, we're here to change the world. You know, we're here to, you know, get Africa on board. We're here to actually build real use and utility and every meaningful metric, we're killing it from social media mentions to user adoption growth, uh, wallet installations, uh, you know, everything you could track it has had exponential growth over the last two years. Um, you know, just give you a sense of transaction volume. We had more transactions in the last 90 days than the entire history of the project combined. And you're telling me we're not, we're a ghost chain and there's no use in utilities. Come on now. Uh, you know, you got, you got some land you want to sell me too. <laughs> it, it's so the way you just explained it, it really does go back to historically what people originally were saying about Cardano, the project, right. you, it's like these, these seeds of lies that got planted. And maybe that's even still the scrutiny is just growing on those, those toxic trees that kind of formed all the way back then years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the bigger the lie, the more you have to do to defend it. And it's, it's gotten to a point where it's pretty absurd and obscene and they write books and these other things. It's like, okay. <laughs> and the only way to combat it, how do you combat it? Just build. 
Well, yeah, combat, just build and ignore it, you know, also just call them out on the absurdity, you know, like I guess there was this one book said, I said, I jumped out of an Apache and you don't even jump out of Apaches. Come on, get your helicopters or you jump out of Blackhawks, not Apaches. I was just like, think through the stupidity uh, of these types of things and, and just the kind of bizarre perspective on life you have to have to just write that down wholesale in these types of things. Uh, yeah. But they do because they want to believe it uh, or, you know, it's just convenient to write it down. And that's the politics of personal destruction. And we failed as a project if Cardano can be dismantled by an attack on me. So it's an indication of our level of decentralization and strength as a community or the fact that I could be completely tarred and feathered and just be burnt to the ground. But Cardano itself survives as a project. It's a good thing. So in many ways, the attacks are actually a good indication of the level of resilience of Cardano. The fact that we've been able to grow and succeed, despite the fact that there's been a lot of obstacles and barriers and these types of things, uh, that really tells you uh, that we're on the right track. And by the way, Bitcoin had the same growth curve. I was around in the early days of Bitcoin, and it was brutal. Whatever incoming I get, whatever incoming Cardano gets, let me assure you, the incoming that Bitcoin had... You entered every conversation with a normal person of, oh, yeah, Bitcoin, isn't that that thing for drugs and money laundering? That's where you started in every single conversation, if they had heard of it. First, they'd never heard of it. And if they'd heard of it, the only thing they've heard is drugs and money laundering and child pornography, Silk Road. That was their frame of reference for Bitcoin. Yet now it's $2 trillion ecosystem. It's huge, right? You know, Bitcoin has become a major thing. Nation states have adopted it. So that criticism, the proclamations of death, the, and it's still attacked. There was an article uh, in December um, from the FT where they said Bitcoin is the biggest Ponzi scheme in human history. It's just it's like... How is that possible? They're still I know. I, like, what corporate overlord do you work for that it is losing because <laughs> of Bitcoin? You know, so it, it makes you stronger at the end of the day. And, and what you don't do is you don't pay attention to it. And what you do do is you try to say, okay, what do we need to achieve to achieve our goals? And you have to have singular focus. I know what we need to do to get Africa on board. And, and we have a collection of technologies that are maturing. We know what we need to do to scale. We know what we need to do to have a great light client experience. We know what we need to do to build a great governance system. We know what we need to do to build a great open source project. We know what we need to do to make a great developer experience and so forth. So just do it. Get it done. Don't talk about it. Do it. Paul Halmos was a famous mathematician and he had this great saying, he was a Hungarian mathematician, he said, the key to writing a good proof is tell them what you're going to do, do it, and tell them what you did. So we're in the do it phase. We're doing it. We're building it. You know, and then after we build it, we'll tell them what we did. Uh, you know, haters will be haters. You know, we'll be poor. <laughs> so building it, right, and especially this year, it sounds like a lot of optimization as well. What do you see the end of? 2022 like especially for scalability and and governance those two things that we were just talking about do you do yeah. you see a lot of progress being done do you see i i think everything will get done that i outlined the side chains the pipelining the import endorsers the library optimization hydra and mithril now there's degrees and flavors like there'll be more hydra stuff to do but at least you'll be able to use hydra for something like microtransactions mithril will be probably completely finished because it's a finite scope of work and we had to bring on some sophisticated contractors for it, like Galois, but they're getting it done. Um, pipelining is just, you know, shades. You can always optimize pipelining and do more in those heartbeats. And the same for input endorsers. There's always ways to optimize that. But some version of it will ship. And at that point, I think we'll be in an exceedingly strong position to match what we see with Solana and these other platforms, uh, but have the added benefit of being actually decentralized. And, uh, and having real theory and strong foundations behind it. And uh, also the extensibility of the protocol, like what we wrote in Ouroboros Kronos or Leos or uh, what we were writing in uh, Omega, uh, these other protocol flavor. There's an obvious path to introduce them, which improves the utility, usability, and security of the system. So we don't have to redesign the protocol or anything like that. So you don't give up a lot, but you get a lot. And yeah. we know how to do it. And say, and I would be personally exceedingly disappointed if uh, there were delays in that. I don't think there should be, and there's no reason for that to be because we understand the work. The code base is in a very good state. 
for the most part, technical debt is pretty low. There's great product management. There's good project management, good program management. QA teams know what to do. We have a good release cycle with February, June, and October, you know, and we have a great test net that's running, and it's uh, it, everything seems to be coming together quite well there. Um, for governance, that's a little harder because I can't compel somebody. I can't pull you out of your seat and say, go vote. I can tell you to do it. I can have it come to a podcast like this and say, like, you should do that. We must. I can, you know, do my best Kennedy impersonation and say, well, that was go pretty good because it's hard. <laughs> you know, I can do that, but, it, you know, I can't force you to do it. I don't have the uh, voting mandate or something like that. So you build it and then you see who shows up and you just see where the numbers are and you, you go with what you got. You know, and that's what we do with U.S. elections. It, it, less than half of the American people voted in the last presidential election. Still have a president. So, you know, allow voting, and it's the ADA holder's decision whether to participate or not. And it, you do education and great experiences, and you build these tools out, and you just see where the cards fall. So we know what we need to do to build a great bureaucracy to execute long-term an open source project that is Cardano and how one would go about funding that bureaucracy, kind of like how America funds itself. So we have a kind of an idea about that. And, you know, next six months is about putting that idea together and getting it done. It's a lot harder to, to actually get meaningful participation because even if you get 50% vote, look at the U.S. voting system. Well, I voted for him because I like his hair. I voted for him because his last name is strong, you know. Well, you know, we haven't had a guy under six foot two as president in a while, so I, I, I wanted to vote for the short guy, you know. It's, it, meanwhile, if somebody's like, I, uh, I spent a lot of time reading all those books on Medicare. I read 26 <laughs> books on how the healthcare system works, and I carefully thought about foreign policy. I went to the, 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 the Woodrow Wilson Foreign Policy School over at Princeton, and I got a PhD in it. And I feel very comfortable to have pine on North African strategy and the and our strategy in the Northern Triangle with El Salvador and Honduras. And uh, your vote counts exactly the same as the yeah. guy who vote. You know, it's so there's this there's this concept of rational ignorance that comes into play. So it's an incentives problem, participation, as much as it is an access problem and a usability problem of what incentives do people have to participate in the system. So you do your best to create incentives, and when you get them right it's magic. And when you get them wrong, you have low participation. So there's some experiments and bets you do and you see what happens with this uh, type of thing. And, oh, you know, if we get it right, it'll be magical. Even if we get it wrong, there's still already 70,000 people. That's a hell of a lot better than Ethereum or Bitcoin or any of these other ecosystems that purport to be decentralized. For the most part, there's only a dozen or two people that, uh, that actually make decisions. It's the two pizza rule. If you can feed all your decision makers with two pizzas, you're probably you're probably doing decentralization wrong. Yeah, so true. It you wrote about I was reading an article you wrote it was in 2015 about how to destroy or save or something along those lines the Bitcoin Foundation. You were talking about governance. Yeah. Is all the way back then, I mean like 7 years ago, the ideas going on in your head did it kind of stem from what you were learning, the problems that Bitcoin had? Like, is it, do, do your ideas of governance go all the way back there? Yeah, I mean, just look at the block size debate. Good people like Mike Hearn and Roger Ver, they got pushed out, you know, and, and they're demonized. And, and back then they were heroes. I grew up with these guys, you know. Mike Hearn was in regular contact with Satoshi. He was the first person to work on the Java Bitcoin client. There's emails back and forth between Mike Hearn and Satoshi. Mike himself forwarded those emails to me. Uh, and so that just gives you a sense of the legacy and pedigree. And he was a Google engineer, very competent guy, very brilliant guy. He was one of the first people to talk about smart contracts outside of, you know, uh, Zabo and the rest of the gang. Left. Gavin Adresen, left. You know, Roger, I left. All these people left because of the way they did things. And and crazy part about Bitcoin, this is why I'm not you know, a big guy in the Bitcoin space, uh, is that they have this mentality that everything that's not them is evil and wrong. Every design decision you make, trade-off you accept, is wrong if it doesn't come from the gospel of Satoshi. That's not a technology, that's a religion. That's doctrine. These types of things. And, you know, the Bitcoin Foundation was so frustrating because there were a lot of people who were there when I was there who were just there to help. 
and they just legitimately wanted to start organizing stuff so that Bitcoin could actually have some notion of a governance layer. And then you had these anarchists come in and they, they basically said, oh, how dare you try to co-opt and corrupt and take over and self-appoint? We're going to burn you down. Okay. And they said, well, if we're not trying to do this, you guys have to understand that it's going to become more and more difficult to evolve the protocol. And then you're going to miss a lot of stuff. And all that stuff you miss, you don't get. You don't get smart contracts. You don't get this and this and this. And then these maxis come by. Well, we got lightning. Eh, not really. We, we got taproot. Oh, so your smart contracts run off chain. Okay. You know, it's, it's, it's not, it's not intellectually honest. You know, either you're committed to the, what Satoshi said, and it's on the blockchain or it's not. And if you take things off, you're under a different security model, in which case you're now competing against all the altcoins. You're competing against every other idea in the entire industry and space. And then you have to argue why you're better, faster, and cheaper when you have an hour settlement time and you use more energy than the entire country of Ecuador. You have to really have an intellectual argument. And their argument is, well, they're wrong and we're right. And that's perpetual motion. And you say, what is the standard of proof? You know, for example, the proof of stake, proof of work. We didn't in 2015 show up and say proof of stake is the end all be all. We didn't know. We were honest about that. So we wrote first GKL. And we said, this is what a blockchain is. Then we said, it doesn't work or not. So we tried to write an impossibility theorem to prove proof of stake doesn't work. And it turned out it does. And we said, wow, okay. And that started a six-year research agenda. Now it's entering its seventh year to build out an entire corpus of logic. Algorand is doing the same. There are others doing the same. And you have thousands of scientists around the world, thousands of engineers around the world pursuing these ends. And according to Bitcoin, every single one of them is wrong, so much so that they're dishonest scammers and everything that they've done is wrong. And they point to a paper that Andrew wrote, Andrew Palestra, uh, why proof of stake has a problem. It's crazy. By the way, consensus protocols existed before proof of work. Byzantine fault tolerant protocols were created in the 1980s. The guy who created them is actually the guy who created Algorand, Sylvia Macaulay, <laughs> amongst others for Byzantine agreement. Uh, so, so yeah, consensus, distributed consensus is like an old topic of computer science. There are more than one way to reach consensus in a Byzantine fault tolerant way in a distributed system. What they're doing is saying the only way is the way we have decided is the way, and that's that. And we were seeing that even in 2015 with the, with the foundation and later on with the big block debate and all the things that happened subsequently. And it's gotten so toxic and bizarre that they even cannibalize each other, you know, uh, the flavor of the week. I wouldn't be surprised to see Max Kaiser be thrown over the bus at some point and these other things, you know. No one is holy enough and pure enough inside that, uh, in that ecosystem. So I sure as hell learned a lot. And I learned that you have to start with principles of what are we actually trying to accomplish here? What are we actually trying to do? The single most important principle to me is decentralization. The second most important principle to me is inclusive accountability. And at times they're at odds with each other. So decentralization is, an easy way of thinking about it is, it's like a game of Jenga. You remove bricks, does the tower still stay up? How many of those bricks can you remove from the tower before the tower collapses? Pretty easy. Even a child could understand that. If you have a truly decentralized system, you can remove lots of bricks and the, and the tower is still there. If you have a hyper-centralized system, you pull one brick out, everything falls over. Look at the centralization of financial assets in 2008. Remove one brick, Lehman Brothers, whole thing falls over. Not exactly a decentralized financial system led to the rise of Bitcoin. You look at other things, like, for example, how resilient, uh, you know, uh, U.S. military is. You can destroy a military base. You can wipe out an entire platoon of soldiers. You can do all kinds of things. It's like a swarm. It always finds a way to, to come around because it's built for resiliency and decentralization in a certain respect. They have the ability to fight wars in multiple theaters. And so it's a very different kind of organization than the organization that was the financial industry. Okay. Uh, and the second is inclusive accountability. Your ability to verify things. The magic of Bitcoin is that when someone sends you a Bitcoin, you don't trust them. You can check it against your copy of the blockchain and you know that that's real. It hasn't been double spent and the coins exist. 
inclusive accountability. Now, the problem is that as the system gets bigger, that gets harder. What happens when you go from a gigabyte to a terabyte to a petabyte to a yixabyte to a yottabyte? You climb the chain. Your ability to verify goes down. This is why Mithra is so important for Cardano because it preserves the principle of inclusive accountability even if you don't have a full copy of the blockchain. Any activity you see, you can use those certificates to check them and you know that they're accurate and you don't have to trust anybody. And this is why Ouroboros is so important because as the value of the token goes up, your K factor grows, your level of decentralization in the system grows, the level of resilience in the system grows. That's simple, you see? And the meta properties governance that's wrapped around it, that's the third component, is change. Everything changes. That's the only constant, change. Okay, so how does your system evolve and grow? Because if it doesn't, you're Yahoo on the BlackBerry looking at your MySpace page. You have to have the ability to stay new and relevant and reinvent yourself again and again. And the problem is the more decentralized you get, that works against your change management. A lot of these people talk about the blockchain trilemma. My blockchain trilemma is decentralization, inclusive accountability, and governance and change. That's the one I care about because everything else is just technology and protocol design. Who cares about that? What I care about is those because they're trade-offs. The more decentralized you get, the harder it is to verify everything. The harder it is to change things. The less decentralized you are, the easier it is to verify things uh, and potentially the easier it is to change things, but the more control a central actor has over the system. You see? So... You have to have these trade-offs. And every time you have great science, what you're doing is moving your trade-off window. You get more for less. You get more benefit, less trade-offs. So we wrote 130 papers because we moved the entire trade-off window of decentralization, inclusive accountability, and governance. It took time. It took effort. That was the point. It wasn't mental masturbation where we're like, yeah, more citations. No, that wasn't the point of this. The point of this was that saying, we weren't happy with the trade-off profile that Bitcoin and Ethereum gave the space. And we said, look, at the end of the day, you're going to have to compromise as you gain users. If you go from a million to a billion, you're going to get hyper-centralized in order to accommodate them. If you go from a million to billion, you're going to lose inclusive accountability with that centralization. If you go from a million to billion, either you're anarchistic and you can never change, like Bitcoin, or you're just going to accept custodians for life, beneficent dictators for life inside the system. Who would want to live in a system like that? How is that fulfilling Satoshi's vision of a decentralized world and a replacement institution? So you can't complain about it. You have to go write papers. You have to go do the work. And you have to say what is possible and what is impossible. There's a very famous theorem in computer science called the FLP impossibility theorem. And it doesn't tell you what you can do. It tells you what you can't do in an asynchronous system. So it's not just about saying what capabilities should we have, it's also about saying what will science let you do? What will protocol design let you do? Arrow's theorem in voting systems is another example of that. It's an impossibility theorem about the robustness of voting systems. So you have all these different things and you have to sort it out and it's frustrating. You take a step forward, sometimes you get two steps back, a paper gets rejected. Sometimes people prove you're wrong. And you have to have the intellectual honesty and integrity to admit that. Along the way, we've had hundreds of false starts. Why well, it took so damn long to get Shelly and Gogan out. I wasn't sitting there being like, yeah, let's just take some holidays. God, man, we were working so fucking hard. Seven days a week sometimes. We had some engineers that didn't take a vacation for four and a half months straight. They missed birthdays and anniversaries and funerals. They kept working every single day. And we had to backfill enormous things. It was the most difficult decision of my career back in 2018 when we said we have to rewrite the core of Cardano. Because I'm thinking or thinking to myself, I lose two years of work. How do I make it up? How do we how do we speed it up so that we cannot feel it? And we tried everything. We even had competing clients with Jormungander, uh, the Rust client, which we turned into Catalyst and built it in parallel with the system. Every opportunity we could find to speed up development we did, in some cases, at enormous expense. We're $100 million over budget over the last six years. But get it done, one way or the other. It has to get done.
because it's the mission, it's the progress, these types of things. And you know, going back to your point about criticism, it is frustrating at times because you see that how disheartening it is to the engineers and to the scientists who put their life and soul into this. They're not writing papers because, you know, oh, well, they pay me some money to do it. Who gives a shit? They're invested in this emotionally. They're invested in this career-wise. Their name, brand, and reputation is connected to this. Some people, the twilight of their career, meaning this is the last major project they're ever going to work on before they retire. And they've now committed six years of their life to this endeavor. How many things, honestly, for your listeners, have you spent six years on? You could be a doctor. You could get a PhD. You could get married and have kids and see your kids in elementary school. <laughs> I mean, that's a big thing, uh, that kind of a time commitment. It's huge. And yet they keep showing up saying, please, sir, can I have some more? Please, sir, can I have some more? I'm ready to go. We're fired up. Let's get it done. And then you got these ship posters on the internet saying, you've accomplished nothing. Just a wallet. Ghost chain. Scam. And then you say, what's the standard? It's like Molten Tar Monster number three, when we finally ship proof of stake. Oh, everybody's done proof of stake. That's easy. We finally ship smart contracts. Well, everybody's spun smart contracts. That's easy. There's no goalposts with them. No matter what you achieve, what you accomplish, they move them so that you, you never actually get anything anywhere in a meaningful way. And no matter how well you do it. Exactly. Same for price. You know, no matter what you achieve there. Yeah, it's, it's terrible. It's the worst thing in the world. It's a scam. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't win. So, you know, you, you just take the good with the bad. And I have my trilemma that I'm chasing, a decentralization, inclusive accountability, and, and governance. And, you know, we think we've done something special. And history will vindicate us if we've done it or not. And it's also a meta point. Everything we've done is open source. So even if you're a critic, maybe you can find some merit in the fact that we advanced the state of the art of the field. All that money got spent on building stuff. Useful or not, it's yours as much as it is mine. So that's another reason I can't understand the criticism at face value. You know, it's like, great, you're telling me that there's nothing useful in all the labors. And they say, I don't have time to look into it. Yet you have time to criticize. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Are you happy with the, the level of decentralization, decentralization at this stage? Yeah, I mean, if I died, Cardano's still going on, so that's something. You can remove that Jenga block. I went to a meditation retreat for an entire week. No one missed me, you know. <laughs> uh, it, 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 so, so it's outgrown its founder, and that, that was an emotional moment, and uh, that's great. And I owe is no longer necessary for the most part. You know, we're, we have a finite set of work we'd like to see done to make it competitive, and we have a mission as a company. We really want to get this uh, real fine Africa done. So I'm happy in that respect. I, I'm unhappy uh, in other respects. Like I'd like to be further along with the decentralized organization and have a voting center already in Daedalus and these types of things. And I'm a very impatient person. You know, that's why I read all these meditation books and these things. I'm trying to become patient because I'm the kind of guy that's like, I want it now, better, faster, cheaper. <laughs> Always. You are. Interesting. Yeah. That Every is day. interesting. You know, and, and I understand the peer review process and the academic process, but I'm always the guy in the room who's like, you know, maybe, maybe we could ship like next week, you know, maybe, maybe we can do this, you know, maybe, maybe we can ship a day off. You know, I'm always the guy who's like pushing them to be deeply uncomfortable. And they're like, no, it has to be this way. It's like, ah, right, fine. You know, and people ask you for deadlines. I saw some people commenting on when you tweeted out, I was going to be here. Uh, well, you know, we have them now, you know, all major changes. There are three of them, February, June, October. It's just a question of what goes in. Uh, and then, you know, there's known life cycles on all of our software. We're on time-based releases with most of the things, and Daedalus and the Node and this other stuff. You know, and there's sometimes delays here and there. Features get pushed from one release to another release. Uh, but for the most part, it's uh, an, an open source project in that respect, you know. And so it's out of my hands. And I, um, I, I in some cases, get sidelined. Um, there's things I like, like I like CIP 007, the Curve Benefit Pledge. It wasn't my call to include it or not. That made me sad, you know. So I, I'd like K to be a thousand right now, you know. There's a bureaucracy behind that, and I don't control that. And so I just say, hey, come on, let's get it done. Say, ah, oh, we'll get around to it, you know. So there are some things that frustrate me that are not fast enough. I'm always impatient, and uh, I'd always want more, you know. The other thing is that I would really like uh, for more positive press to come out about Cardano. And I think that has to do with the fact that we 
don't have a great social media game yet. You know, we need to improve that. And once you have a good social media game, then you know naturally the uh, debate changes a little bit, and there's latency behind it. There's a lot of people in the Ethereum ecosystem that still don't even believe we have decentralization. They still don't even believe staking is there, much less smart contracts. Yeah. You know, and that one transaction per block thing is still spreading. I had a friend at an Ethereum developer meetup, and he mentioned Cardano. I was like, guys, you can't build anything on Cardano. You only get one transaction a block. <laughs> That's crazy. It's like. Where okay. Do you even begin? Where do you even I, start? Where I know. Do you even start? I know. So, it's, it's crazy. So exposure on a social media aspect. I, I wanted to ask you, it was probably one of the last things I'll, I'll ask you. You were recently talking about the viral, virality of Cardano. And, you know, I, I've never really been one to think that Cardano needs marketing. Like, I, I wouldn't just straight out say that. But what does that look like to you? Well, it needs product marketing. So, for example, our network stack is the most sophisticated and best network stack in the entire industry for all proof-of-stake protocols. Why? Well, no one really can answer that outside of a small handful of people that worked on the network stack, and they can talk about the multiplexing, and they can talk about these miniature protocol ideas and how they can be all model with state machines and how we can simulate things that other people can't. And there's a lovely paper out of Stanford from, written by David Shee and his co-authors at uh, MIT that kind of talk about all the problems that proof-of-stake protocols have with the network stack that the Bitcoin core developers actually were aware of. It was one of the reasons why they were so dismissive of proof-of-stake. Uh, and it turns out we solved a lot of those problems. Even the paper references us. So that's great, but good product marketing will actually get those USPs down on paper, build infographics, make them viral. And then the community can spread that and talk about that and get people excited about it. And that's one of hundreds of little things that we put in, pieces of magic that most people don't care about, and don't see or even know about. It's like having a beautiful layout of transistors and other things, uh, you know, like uh, capacitors on your, on your motherboard inside your computer. You know, you can have your memory in a certain place. It's all shiny and nice. And your CPU can be real pretty and just absolutely perfect cabling job. But let's say it's a closed case. You can't see inside of it. So all that magic is hidden. Product marketing is about opening the case up, putting an exhibition window in it, allowing people to see the memory and all the other stuff, get them excited about it. So that does need to be done. And it's, it's a difficult task because it slows down development. Because at the end of the day, the marketers then have to talk to the engineers and the scientists, and these are non-trivial conversations. It's a lot of work, and that's time they're not spending writing papers and implementing code. So there's trade-offs there. But we've reached a scale where it needs to be done, and it will be done. Uh, and then good ground game for social media. I, I mean, good surrogacy development, good resources for surrogates, good memes, very important, good infographics, these types of things. They really help create awareness and get people excited and propagate information and deal with FUD. FUD travels so quickly in this space. Uh, it used to be a game. They stopped doing it, thank God. But years ago, they used to, on 4chan and other places, make up that founders of projects are dead. Like, I was killed three times in Vitalik 7. You know? And they say, oh, Vitalik was killed in a car accident. And then it'd even sometimes get picked up by media. And then, of course, it'd hit the price. And it spread like wildfire. Everybody's retweeting. Everybody's going to Facebook. And these people are ringing my phone saying, Charles, are you okay? I said, what the fuck are you talking about? It's like, and they'd, they'd be real clever. They do it when I'm going fishing or on vacation or something like that. So it'd be harder to reach me, you know, these types of things. So uh, good social media game gives you some resilience against that stuff. And it, it helps protect people in the short term from those things. In addition to getting good facts out. So, and that's kind of, a lot of that uh, is up to kind of the community and, you know, content creators. I mean, is that kind of something, like content creators like myself, for instance, is that something that we could help with, I guess, as well? Yeah, because you're consumers of it. You know, if they're good infographics, good product marketing, it should be easy for you to understand and then integrate and explain the protocol and tell people. That's how you do surrogacy development. And if there are things you don't understand, there should be a way to commission work. There should be a place to go to ask questions. There should be a process to get some things done and demystified. You have to understand there are different consumers for different artifacts. We wrote the 130 papers for scientists. So when you look at them, they got crazy math in them. You know, there's weird ass proofs. There's like strange Greek symbols. And you're like, holy shit, I haven't seen this since the fraternity days. You know, stuff is crazy in there. 
it's not meant for normal people, and that's fine, okay? Because it, the point is to communicate scientific knowledge to scientists and have them be able to speak in that domain-specific language. Just like laws are not necessarily written for normal people to read. They're written for lawyers to read and, and interpret. And just like, you know, if you're a physicist, your physics papers aren't written for mainstream people to read, like oh, quantum chromodynamics. What the fuck is that? You know, it's, it's crazy stuff. So there needs to be somebody who translates that arcane work and says, well, what is this really about? What's the value of that? And then people like yourself would then consume the translations. It's yeah. not reasonable to assume that a podcaster is going to go read the Ouroboros papers, understand them, and understand why they're special and unique and meaningful. Any hey, more so than it's... A lot of people have. <laughs> There's several Ouroboros explainer videos and... And so forth. So, you know, through the years, we've done blog posts and we've done YouTube videos and uh, interviews and things like that. But I think we need to up that game a little bit. And that's going to be a big focus in uh, 2022. And then I think that's going to help a lot create the competitive differentiation so people can really understand how magical it is. And also the cross industry value of Cardano. Like, for example, the Bitcoin maxis, even if they hate us, we're right now the experiment for how to do smart contracts natively on Bitcoin. If they wanted to do it, it's going to look something like extended UTXO and Plutus. So if you're a maxi, our success is your success. We're basically doing your homework for you, and you can crib note off of it, you can copy off of it. But they don't get that. They think it's some zero. And uh, maybe if we communicated a little bit better, that would help build some inroads um, here and there. For example, our hard fork combinator is a perfect way to upgrade a cryptocurrency. And if Ethereum had it, their road to Ethereum 2 would be significantly easier. And they would have to put in these difficulty bombs and all these other things, right? You know, so yeah. we have that native advantage. Isn't that good for them to study that type of stuff? The formal verification work we do, people don't remember that because we're EVM interoperable, by definition, you have to certify Ethereum smart contracts. So doesn't that mean that the work we do there helps Vitalik and his cohorts build better solidity code? You know, and you have their ecosystem. So, so that's the other side of good product marketing is recognizing the enemy of my enemy is my friend and what's good for me might be good for them. Yeah. I think Cardano is pretty good at building bridges. I think it's what makes it tough as the other, the other end of the spectrum. Ah, they hate me. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> well, Charles, it's an hour and a half. I appreciate you. I have like so many more questions relating to Cardano, crypto, life, really life. But, you know, uh, hopefully maybe like maybe we can get like a mid-year update, have you back on the channel, see how things like governance, scalability is going, all that good stuff and, and get an update if that would be cool. All right. I suppose we should end it with a cone since I'm uh, reading so much Buddhist literature and meditation stuff. So there's a, there, my favorite one is and I included it in the mindfulness write up that I did. Uh, so there are three monks that are sitting in a monastery. Uh, and uh, the roof starts leaking. So the Zen master tells them to go get something for it. So the first monk, he comes back with a bucket. And the other one, he comes back with a basket. The one who brought the bucket is harshly punished, and the one who brought the basket is praised. So try to, try to figure that one out. Interesting. <laughs> I, I was waiting for you to keep going, so now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to rewatch this now. And yeah. we're going to... Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's the code. It's like it really messes with your mind. So you have to kind of figure out why one was praised and the other not and what the purpose of it was. It, All right. This has been a lot of fun, Dan. The comments will be interesting on that one, too. Yeah. Thanks so much, Charles. I appreciate you, man. God bless you. And we'll talk to you soon. Cheers.